Good morning. And welcome to worship today. It is wonderful to be together in the house of our God as we come to bring him praise, as we come to be nurtured by his word and to fellowship together. Uh, it's wonderful as your pastor to be back again after our trip to, to Chicago last week and uh, to spend some time down there and see different sites, wonderful sites, uh, and yet to be able to come home uh, is a great thing. So I'm glad to be back. <clears throat> our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 34. The psalmist writes, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. O oh Lord, our gracious God and Father, as we come before you, our hearts and our minds and our voices echo the words of the psalmist, that we declare and we testify and we praise you for your goodness. We testify and praise you because you are a faithful God, you are the eternal God. And Lord God, you are also the God of the afflicted. That all who turn to you in, in whatever lowly estate they are in, whatever struggle, whatever stress, whatever is drawing their mind or their heart or their life from you, Lord, you promise to be present. And so, Lord God, this morning we pray that, that as we meditate on what it means for you to be our refuge, we pray that, that not only would that be true when, when things are going well, that we say, yep, you are the rock that never moves. But Lord God, would you be the one that we turn to as well in the most devastating times in our lives? Would you be praised for you never change? All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. As we come into worship, let's stand to sing, Come People of the Risen King. Christ through every age, our 
As we come into our God's presence, we know that he is the one who has called us here, and he welcomes us with these words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We continue to praise him this morning with, I love to tell the story. As we come into our time of confession and the assurance of pardon this morning, uh, we begin in a little bit different place than, than what we usually hear. Uh, we go back to the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs, if you know the book, it, it has a, a few major themes, but one of those themes is of wisdom and folly, uh, of the person who is wise, who is upright, who is discerning, who is prudent, and the person who is foolish. And I think about with that then of of what Jesus spoke in, in a parable that he talked about, the wise man who builds his house on the rock and has a, a firm foundation, the storms come, it will not be shaken. And the foolish person who builds his house on the sand, when the waves come, the storm beats on it, it shifts, and it falls apart. Brothers and sisters, you and I are called to a life of wisdom. And that wisdom is in the Lord. It's in his decrees, but it's also in his grace. 
And so hear these words from Proverbs 14. The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears hers down. He whose walk is upright fears the Lord, but he whose ways are devious despises him. A fool's talk brings a rod to his back, but the lips of the wise protect them. A truthful witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. The mocker seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge comes easily to the discerning. Stay away from a foolish man, for you will not find knowledge on his lips. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of the fools is deception. Fools mock at making amends for sins, but goodwill is found among the upright. Each heart knows its own bitterness, and no one else can share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The faithless will be fully repaid for their deeds, the good man rewarded for his. A simple man believes nothing, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. A wise man fears the Lord and shuns evil but a fool is hot-headed and reckless. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. O Lord our God, who is sovereign, who is almighty, who is all-knowing. You know each one of us. You know each of our days. You know each of our years. You know things before they come into existence. You know our thoughts. You know our attitudes. You know our motives. You know our deeds. You know the words that we speak and that we hold our tongues from speaking. Oh, Lord God, as we think about what, it, what is written in the book of Romans, we, we are reminded that, that no one is good. There's not even one. We're reminded that from within come, come evil thoughts, that, that our tongues can be like the, the, the viper's toxins. We are reminded here that, again, the, the foolish person lives a life that is reckless, lives a life that will fall apart that has no future. Oh Lord, it'd be easy to say that, that if we do the, all the right things that we indeed will, will walk with you or that if the number of good deeds outnumber the bad that, that we'll have a place with you and yet we know that too simply is not the case. But Lord God, we need your redemption. We need the blood of Jesus, our sacrifice, to come and to cleanse us. Lord, we are thankful that, that we have the hope that, that that has already been done and that you have extended yourself by grace to us to reconcile us to you. That you, by your Holy Spirit, are, are purifying our hearts even right now as we repent of the ways that we have gone astray from you. Lord God, we pray that, that you would renew us, that we would put to death the deeds of the flesh, and that we would grow and put on the self that is in you. And so, Lord God, come. Come and move in us, not only today and in this time, but, Lord God, move in us in, in such a way that we recognize in our day-to-day -day lives that, that you are present, that you are working inside us, that you are calling us to a new and better way of life, a way that is holy and upright in you. May we draw people to you through our actions and cause them to see your love and to see the way that you change people. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. And so we hear these words from the book of Jude. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. Foolish men. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and who do not have the Spirit. 
But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. But here's what it all comes back to. Here's the root. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that is our hope, the Savior, Jesus Christ alone. Let's respond with thanksgiving with amazing grace. My chains are gone. chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, my chains are gone. Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are. Before we go to our God in prayer, I'm going to have Eric uh, cue up a video for us. This is a, a thank you 
uh, that we receive from Darcy Verberg, one of the missionaries that we support uh, over in Uganda, uh, and she shared a video with us. So go ahead if you could play that. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, God has been very faithful, and even though there are challenges and hard situations, I'm very glad to be here in Kutido, working among the Karmachong people here in the northern part of Uganda. Thank you so much for your prayers, for your support, because that makes it possible for me to, to be here. And now in September, I will be making two years. And my idea was to go back and come and visit Brazil. But while I was praying about it, I really sensed the Lord saying to me that this was not the right time. So I'm still around. And maybe next year, I will come for a visit. But thank you so much. And that God may continue to bless you. And that he may continue to pour his grace upon your lives. Let's go to our God in prayer this morning. Oh Lord, how thankful we are that as we come together on this morning that you have sent us gray, cloudy, rainy skies. Lord, how thankful we are that after days and weeks and months of little rain, that here we look out and, and we've had, it seems, more hours with rain than without, and, and that there are puddles in our parking lots and curbs and even the fields. And Lord God, that you are the one who has provided that, we are so grateful to you. Lord God, for the crops and, and for lawns, for gardens, that you have been faithful to us. Lord God, that, that you have called us to trust in you, not only over uh, the, the major things in, in life of salvation and, and, and eternity, but you have called us to trust in you with where our food comes from, and with where our livelihood comes from. And Lord God, for some of us and, and for many throughout our area, that is to, to till the soil, that is to, to grow from seed and, and to harvest a crop. And so we are thankful for that. Lord God, we are thankful for, for all the provisions that you have provided for us recently, that you have provided healing, oh God, and that you have provided throughout the surgery that, that Steve had in, in the last couple of weeks to, to apparently remove this cancer we pray, O oh God, that you continue to be with him and, and to strengthen him, and, and, and Lord God, keep him. We pray, O oh God, for those who are, are preparing for new things as we think of, of the upcoming school year and we think of, of our local schools, both Baldwin Woodville and, and of Baldwin Christian. And Lord God, as we think of, of faculty and school boards and staff and, and volunteers, the many hands that it takes to, to make the school year work, and especially when we are in the midst of, of uncertain seasons, when there have been changes and there's hopes of, of going back to normal, and, and yet, Lord God, we wonder where things are going in, in, in the world and, and with health right now. We pray that, that you would give grace and that you would grant strength and wisdom to those who lead our children, who guide them and instruct them. We pray, O oh God, that your love would be shown even in the actions that they undertake before the school year begins. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God who is yet healing. And we think of those who are still battling different ailments and, and diseases. As we think also of Mary and, and as she is receiving tests to, to figure out what is causing an infection in her body, we pray that you'd be near unto her. We pray for Dave and Karen too, Lord God, that you would bless them and, and comfort them as they await the, the news for that. Lord God, we think of others who are battling with different forms of cancer as, as Mary Claire has, has started up radiation this week and, and will be undergoing that in the next few weeks. We pray that that would be helpful. Lord God, that as painful and as destructive as it can be to the body to, 
to, to kill the cancer cells. Lord God, would you restore her to health? Would you indeed bring healing to her body through these weeks and months ahead? We think of others, oh God, as we think, continue to think of Al and, and Jody and Raquel and, and others in our lives who are battling with cancer, who are battling with, with chronic ailments. Lord, for some that there are treatments for and, and for others that there are not. And Lord, for some that there are treatments that have done apparently more harm than good. And as we rely on you and for your providence, your healing, we pray that you indeed would bring healing. Lord, we think of others who are going through different battles of their own, who are struggling with, with addiction, who are struggling with abuse, and, and who, are, who have been turned away by loved ones. We think of those who are, who are longing to see their loved ones but who are unable to cross borders because of COVID. We think of those, especially in places of the world where COVID continues to rage, and, and Lord God, that there aren't vaccines and that there not, has not been uh, a going down of, of symptoms and a going down of cases. We pray that you would bring an end to this. Lord, we pray that you'd be with our nation as we think about all the different things that our government is involved in and we watch in recent weeks over debates around budgets and, and spending and, and Lord God there is so much that, that we can just say well it doesn't even matter to us uh, it just goes over our head they're, they're involved in frivolous spending and, and yet Lord God we pray that your will would be done through our government figures in our communities in our states in our nation we pray oh God that you would instill these men and women with, with good leadership, with wise leadership, with leadership that, that does turn to you, that does not seek their own popularity, their own fame, their own wealth above all things, but Lord God, that they would serve for the good of, of the people. Lord God, we pray that, that when decisions are made that go strongly against what we believe, we pray that you would help us to see the good that, that you might be working out. Lord God, even when things cause damage, allow us to see the way that you may be sending judgment or maybe using pain to work and to correct us. Lord, we pray this morning that you would continue to, to bless and, and to protect the men and women who serve in, in our military, for members who are stationed across this country and who are overseas, who are spending time away from, from their families and, and other loved ones. We pray, O oh God, that you would protect them and, and that in places of, of combat as well as in places of peace, that you would allow them to, to show your love and that you might draw people to you through their fellow soldiers. Lord God, we pray that as we continue on throughout this day that, and throughout this week that you would be with us, that you would show us opportunities for service. For service. Lord God, as we give of our offerings this morning to, uh, to the general fund and we think of, of the many ministries that can be blessed through that, we do think of, of Hope Center Ministries up in Winnipeg. And as Lord God, as we have this unique opportunity to help the work of our brothers and sisters across the border in Canada and and as they reach into their own community uh, to provide chaplaincy, to show your love, to tell of your love, we pray, O oh God, that you would bless the work that is being done there. We thank too, Lord God, of our missionaries. We are so thankful to, to be able to hear from Dersey and, and to see the, the blessings and the call that you have put on her life. That, Lord God, as she serves in the medical field over in Uganda, you have the opportunity through her uh, to show love. And we pray, O oh God, that you will continue to guide her and to hold her in your truth and in the call you have put in her life. We continue to think of our other ministries, O oh God, too, for, for the Kennedys and, and their work in Japan and, and for uh, the continuing pain that, that Glenn experiences. Give him what he stands in need of. We pray, O oh God, for Daniel Kabuji and for the work that he's involved in among the children in, in Nairobi. Lord God, be with him and give him clarity and 
and, and a continued passion for, for his ministry. We think too, oh God, of, of Nicole as she had this camp this past week, and, and Lord God, we pray that that went well and, and that was edifying and that there may even have been the lives of, of these young people drawn to you, that you revealed your perfect love and your salvation for them. Lord God, we continue to think of other places around the world that, that we have an impact on, that we have the opportunity to, to extend a hand or a dollar of service to. As we think of, of the work of, of Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, Lord God, we pray that you would not only be blessing children with the ability to to go on with their lives and, and to grow in, in their personhood and in their education, but that you indeed would surround them with people who can testify to your love and testify to the gospel. Lord, we think of others who are, are involved in, in similar work, who are involved in uh, creating business opportunities, who are teaching about farming, who are helping uh, to, to dig wells and, and to uh, serve in, in different medical ways. Lord God, in, in all these things, we pray that you would protect your servants, but also that you would bring clarity to people who have perhaps never heard your truth before. Lord God, may it change hearts, may it change their lives, and would you draw them to yourself. Lord God, we pray this morning that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that as we enter into your word, Lord God, that we would be reminded of all these many things, that we're praying for people around the globe as much as we are praying for people in our own neighborhoods, as we're praying for people across the section, as we're praying for people who, who are just moving into this community and into this area. Lord God, that they would know you, even though we might not know their name yet, or if we do know their name and, and have been praying for them for a very long time, we pray that you would yet do a good work in them and that your spirit might move through us. But, O oh Lord God, bring us clarity about our faith and about the hope that we have, too. All this we pray in your Son's precious name. Amen. Boys, I think you're the only ones here. You want to do a children's message? Yeah? All right, let's do it. If there are any kids that I don't see, you're welcome to come up, too. Or older kids, right? How are you guys doing? Good? My kids and my wife are gone, right? They're still in Michigan. They're with Christie's family. They're having fun out on a lake and driving around golf carts. And it is Christmas in July in the resort that they're staying at. And so they got to see all sorts of different blow-up inflatables. And they're having fun, but I want them to come back, right? All right. Well, one of the things I've been doing while they've been gone this week is praying for them. And I want you to think about this, if we can go ahead to the pre-sermon slides, Eric. Uh, you can see on the map that this is how far they are. So we're way up in the top left corner, right, in Baldwin. And they're down over there, south of Grand Rapids, southeast of Holland, Michigan. And it is 360 miles. The problem is there's that little lake in the middle there, right? There's that thing called Lake Michigan that annoys me greatly. Uh, and that's because... I don't have a nice boat that can get across that, and so we end up driving around it. And so instead of being 360 miles, it ends up being 530 miles to get from where they are to get back up here. It says it takes 8 hours and 41 minutes. It takes over 9 hours usually, if not over 10 hours. So that's a long ways, right? Well, why am I talking about that? Well, I'm talking about it because today we're going to start to look at the book of Colossians. And the Colossians were the people who lived in this city back in ancient times, the city of Colossae. Uh, and so Colossae uh, was actually right around 530 miles from Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is where the church began. It's where Jesus was crucified, where all the church really started out. And so straight line, 530 miles, just as far as it is from where my wife is and kids are to here. Uh, Back then, you could sail. You wouldn't take a straight route. You would take a, a bit of a curvy route across the Mediterranean and get through most of that distance. But if you wanted to drive today, you'd have to start down there in Jerusalem. You'd drive through Syria. You'd get up into Turkey, and it's over 1,000 miles. 
that's a really long way, right? 530 miles to 1,000 miles is a huge distance. But our text is going to tell us today that Paul really hadn't met these people before. He hadn't been there. He hadn't visited or or seen this whole congregation. And yet he's going to write, We always thank God the Father when we pray for you, because we've heard of your faith and of the love you have. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And so even though they hadn't met and they hadn't seen each other, they weren't close to each other, they were still worth praying for. And so as you guys think about the, the video that we got to see, it was with Dersey Verberg, and Dersey is one of those two black stars in Africa. You guys' family used to serve kind of over in that area. Uh, and she was a neighbor of the Cools when they lived in Brazil, but, but most of us don't know them or don't know her. We've never seen her. Uh, we haven't met the people in Uganda that she's ministering to. Uh, we haven't, some of us, met the Kennedys, and we haven't met the people they serve in Japan way over on the the right side. Uh, I haven't met Daniel Kabuji in Kenya, or the kids that he's serving with. Uh, I have met Nicole, who's up in France. Uh, She was here a a couple times uh, a year or so ago. Um, But even though we haven't met them, or, or, or we may not necessarily see them all that often, or meet the people they minister to, we can still pray for them, right? We're imitating Paul. We're imitating Jesus. Jesus before he was crucified, prayed for all the believers, for all the saints that would come to know him. And so it's good for us to pray for people hundreds and thousands of miles away, because what we do when we pray is we trust that God is going to work. And so that's what I want to encourage you guys to do, to continue to pray for people that maybe we don't know, uh, pray for them by name, pray for them uh, that simply God would move, uh, because we're trusting that he can change their hearts and minds. And one day, We hope to see them. One day we hope to join them in the kingdom of God. All right, let's pray. Dear God, we give you thanks for this day and for uh, the opportunity again to to draw near to you and and to turn to you on behalf of uh, of missionaries and to turn to you on behalf of of fellow believers and and people who you are drawing to yourself. Uh, We pray, O God, that that as we think about Paul's ministry and, and the work that he did among people he didn't know, Lord God, that there are people we don't know, again, near and far, uh, who you may have us have an impact on. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would use us and that you would use our resources for your kingdom. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you for coming out. So exciting. Oh, man. Now I'm going to create jealousy among brothers. We're going to have issues. Don't tell my kids that you took two, though, right? All right. Well, with that, I invite you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verses 1 through 14. Can we go back to that slide, Eric? Uh, As you may have seen in the midweek update or uh, read in your bulletin, read on the slide, heard me just say, we're going uh, into a series through the book of Colossians. Uh, And I don't normally name these series when we just work through a book of the Bible, but this one I I am naming. I'm calling it something, and that is the Christ and the Believer series. Christ and the Believer, and that's because if you spend any amount of time in Colossians, you're going to repeatedly come across that name or that title, of Christ. And Christ means the anointed one of God. And and so you're reading about Jesus, the sole hope that God offers the world for redemption. And you hear him mentioned again and again and again and again and again and again. Uh, And and so with that, you'll likely also notice that this is a book written by a believer, to believers, for believers. Uh, If you're not a believer or you're wondering what a a non-believer might get out of Colossians, Uh, you would hopefully find that it's a solid guide about the faith, about the benefits of faith. Uh, But hopefully even more, uh, if it's through this series, you would hear and experience the Holy Spirit's help that would persuade you 
to the hope that we have, if we are believers, that would persuade others uh, to the hope of salvation. And so that's the big picture. Uh, For some details, again, this is where the city of Colossae was, uh, northwest of Jerusalem, uh, 500 to 1,000 miles away, depending on how you're getting there. The church was likely started uh, by a man named Epaphras. We hear his name in verse 7 today. Uh, And historians believe that Colossae was quite an important city before this letter was written. And so when this letter arrived, it was a city uh, that was in a decline. I read it was the town that you kind of pass through on your way to the bigger cities, the more important cities. Uh, based on pictures that I've seen taken today, uh, there isn't much to see here. The ruins are covered with a mound of, of dirt and grass, uh, and so this isn't one of the, the uh, sort of magnificent places uh, that we sometimes get to see overseas. Uh, and while it may seem like I'm painting this really bleak, grim, underwhelming picture of these Christians, I do want us to remember that this place was significant enough that an apostle wrote a letter to them. This was a significant enough place that God so spoke that these words are to be in Scripture. And so even though we might think, yeah, this is an an out-of-the-way city of people who doesn't really matter in, in the grand history of the world, God still spoke to them. And so let's hear the word of the Lord this morning, chapter 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God, our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it, and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you, and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, Bearing strength or being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, when Christy and I were in Chicago last week, we relied heavily on public transportation. As much as I love the city that I grew up nearby, I hate driving in it, and and so we said, let's stick to trains and buses, and they had a really good deal. Uh, And so late one afternoon, I think we had ended up at Navy Pier at that point on the lake shore, uh, we decided that that we were going to go back to our hotel and figure out our dinner plans. And so we got on a bus, took it to a train, and And when we got up to the platform, I realized that this train that we were on the platform for was going in the opposite direction. And it's not like you can just hop over and and everything goes well due to timing. It really didn't make sense to drag Krabby, Addie, and Brooks down the stairs, haul the stroller along, go across the street, go back up the stairs, and get on the right side. And so we said, let's just get on the train. And after a couple minutes, I realized, you know what, there's a place I looked at, a restaurant, that I think we can kind of maneuver our way to this way. And so we kept on riding the train, then we got on a bus, and we went to Pequod's Pizza. I hadn't been there before, I I really didn't know what to expect, but upon entering this restaurant, we told them we wanted to dine in, and they asked us, have you made a reservation? (laughs) Nope, nope, didn't do that. 
This was that spur of a moment decision. It was only about 45 minutes from when I decided we were going to, to go to this place to when we got there. There were only four of us plus Faya in the stroller. Why would you need a reservation on a weekday? Well, the guy looked at his reservation list and he talked out loud, thinking to himself, and he told us, it's going to be about two hours. Uh, it'll be 8.30 when you guys can finally get in. Uh, we had already eaten that late once that week, but now we had two hours that we had to figure out what are we going to do up here, and, and we said, nope, that's not happening. And so we put in an order for carryout. It took us 45 minutes, and we went and ate at a nearby park. Why am I telling you that? Well, as we begin this morning, I want us to have two words in our minds. And the first is the word that goes along with that. It's in the bottom picture. Uh, if you can see it, it's a table with a reserved sign on top of it. And what would a reservation have done? It would have put our name in. It would have staked our claim on a certain table at a certain time. And instead of being not just the only ones, but one of several couples or groups that came by that night and got turned away, we would have had the true experience. We would have had a table. We would have eaten inside. That's a reservation and its purpose. But the other word goes along with that top picture. It's the word that comes from our message's title, the word inheritance. And an inheritance, of course, is what we think about when we think about our death. Are there things that we want to pass along to our loved ones? For those of you who are a bit younger, maybe you're looking at it from the perspective of, of are there things that I'm hoping for or longing for or expecting from someone who's a little bit older from me? Of course, maybe it's money, maybe it's something of sentimental value, a family heirloom jewelry, or as is often the case in rural communities, farmland. If something belongs to you, you have the decision to make, do you want to pass it along to someone else? When they get it, they take ownership of that. They get to use it. They get to, to, to do whatever they want with it. They get to carry on that gift. But with an inheritance, something is given, something is received, and it's typically meant to be beneficial. And so this morning, here we are. We're looking at what I'm calling the believer's inheritance, which I would say is part of the core of Paul's introduction to the Colossians. And, and let's be clear, I'm not equating what people of faith receive to, to pizza and a seat in a crowded restaurant. I'm not equating the inheritance of believers to any sum of money or to jewelry or an heirloom or to farmland, but bearing in mind what we understand of reservations and inheritances, I think can help us better understand what we do have and what we're looking forward to. And so with that said, we get to our first point this morning, which is this question, what is the believer's inheritance? Again, Paul's writing to people who already do believe. He's writing to a church. And if we are like them, we can say the same things about ourselves. What's the benefit? What's the reward? What's reserved for us? Well, listen again to what Paul writes in verses 5 and 6. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, that's reserved for you in heaven, and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Picking up later in verse 12, he tells them that he's giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. What's the inheritance? Well, it's, it's to be in the kingdom of light because he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. And so you already know, I know you know, that the hope that is reserved for believers that we are promised to have is one that we are looking forward to. What Paul is telling these believers is that they must remember it is in heaven, it is not on this earth. It is not yet, it is, or it is not yet, it is not now. It's not here and now. The inheritance is that we will be brought into the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of the Christ, the one who God sent because he loved us and who redeemed us of our sin. The ultimate benefits of being a Christian, of being one who believes in the God of the Bible, trusting in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the ultimate benefits must be waited for. 
And that, of course, doesn't mean that there's not benefits to enjoy during our lifetimes here on earth. But it is important that we keep an appropriate mindset. Because as we go through this life, things aren't so great. We look around at the world and we experience struggles. We can say up until this weekend and probably still after this weekend, I believe in God, but this drought is killing my livelihood. Or I've been struggling with this sin and yet I believe in God. Why is that? Or I'm lonely, my my spouse passed away. Or or I'm lonely, I, I can't find a spouse. Why is that? We can watch the news and see what happens in places like Minneapolis and Chicago especially, but but even in smaller communities, and we we see violence. We see people being harmed and injured and killed. We see sickness and death. We see hatred and division and cursing and immorality. And it'd be easy to say, well, if all that's here, God must have gone missing. God's gone. If like the people of Colossae, we see declines in what used to be, remember, brothers and sisters, that our greatest inheritance is in another time and another place. It is not yet, we must wait for it. Similar to how a a reservation gets you minutes or, or hours ahead, know that the time will come for this inheritance. But before we go any further, we have to back up. We have to ask the question, how do we get that? How do we get the inheritance? And you can see up on the screen that I've I've kept the two passages that I I shared before, but I've added a third one here. In verses 5 and 6, Paul is clear. You have to have faith. But where does faith originate? Where does it come from? Right? It'd be easy to say, well, just read the Bible, learn about Jesus. When someone asks you a question about faith or heaven, just tell them the name of Jesus, and, and you know what? You'll be in heaven. You'll inherit the kingdom of God. But that's not the end of the answer. Because faith is not solely a matter of intellect. It's not just having the right verses or the right answers. And, and that's what the other passages do. They, they help shape our understanding. The Apostle Paul could speak of his own experience as someone who hated Christians, who hated the church, who wanted to to imprison and kill Christians. And yet, of course, his story is that God miraculously intervened in his life, showed up on that road to Damascus and, and changed him. That day and in the days and the years to come, he changed his life, he changed his head, he changed his heart. It wasn't anything that, that Paul just knew. But now it continues throughout his ministry that he tells this church that his regular prayer has been asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. In verse 12, Paul writes that it's the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from darkness and brought us into his Son's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, this is why it is so important that we understand and and that we are articulate when we talk about people coming to the faith, when we talk about our own faith story or faith journey. Because it's not something that you and I just did, that we just chose, that we just accepted. Right? The Reformed tradition has carried on the doctrine of irresistible grace, or if you remember our, our Canons of Dort series, I use that term, effectual grace. And that testifies to our need for God to take us captive, our need for him to fill us with knowledge, our need for him to give us hope and faith and the love of him. Yes, we can speak that that there probably was a day in our lives in which we said, you know what, on that day I profess Jesus. On that day I I did decide, I I said, I, I do believe I want him, I want his benefit. But let's go back to those concepts I mentioned earlier, the reservation and the inheritance. If God hasn't put you in his will, so to speak, first, you don't inherit the benefit. If God isn't offering you a reserved seat that you will one day sit on and enjoy the banquet feast of his kingdom, you can't just show up and stake a claim on that. We must look to God, to the Holy Spirit, to instill faith and love in the hearts of men and women, to draw them to himself. 
again, I, I'm talking about the, the primary blessing that we're looking at today. The primary inheritance is something yet to come, but, but this guidance and this aid of the Holy Spirit is a benefit that we receive right now in this life. But with that, let's come to our third point. What do we do with the inheritance? Knowing the inheritance, how we get it, if we have it, what do we do with it? If you have a reservation at a restaurant, most of the time at least, not always. We had this happen at our wedding reception, or wedding rehearsal reception actually, that we had a, a reservation at this restaurant and we showed up with all of our family and, and they said, no, we don't have your name down. And it's like, oh, that was great. We still got in half an hour late, don't worry. But most of the time, if you have a reservation at a restaurant, you can be confident that you're going to get a spot. Maybe you wait a few minutes, a little bit longer, because the table isn't cleared off yet, but, but it shouldn't be too long. Right? You can arrive later. You don't have to wait impatiently and hungrily in the restaurant. But when it comes to receiving an inheritance from a loved one, uh, perhaps you're someone who says, oh, I know I'm not receiving anything, uh, and that's not a big deal. It doesn't change things. But maybe you have been told that you're going to receive this substantial inheritance, this substantial amount of money, and that has a significant impact. And some people change how they spend their money, how they take out loans. They just say, well, when so-and-so dies, I'm just going to pay it off. It's rather crass, but that's what people do. But so too farmers, they might plan their whole livelihood, their whole lives based on land that they expect to inherit. And so in a similar way to that, the hope that we have from our inheritance in Christ, what he offers in the gift of his death on the cross, that should have a whole life change. That should change everything. That's what Paul starts to talk about in verse 6, but then explains more fully in verses 10 through 12. We pray, that, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. In Philippians 1.27, Paul writes, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, what is that? What does it mean to live worthy of the gospel, worth Christ? Well, here in Colossians 1, it has four parts. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to God the Father. The, the sign outside of our church got changed on Friday, but, but if you remember what it said before, it, it read something to the extent, Christ died for your sins, what have you done for him? And I'll say I received at least one email wondering, well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, and, and they wanted to make sure we weren't thinking, well, do you have to do something for your salvation? Are you talking about satisfying Jesus? No. No, that sign's message was, was talking about how if you have been redeemed, how do things change for you? How do things change for us? And we're told, do this four things. Bear fruit in good works, grow in knowing God, be strengthened to be enduring and patient, and give thanks joyfully. That is what Christians are called to do because God called us to himself, because Jesus died for us, and because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are changed. But that doesn't mean that all Christians all of a sudden look like robots. Or that we're all uniform, that we wake up at the same time every day, we do the exact same things, and people say, well, you look different from so-and-so, you must not be a Christian. No, we have different passions, we have different interests, God has created us uniquely. Some Christians are, are still young in the faith, they still need milk, while some can eat meat. Some don't understand, but some know much. There are different callings that God puts on each of our lives, not all are to be pastors and teachers. Not all are to be elders and deacons. But God does call people to those things, and when that's recognized, we know that he will gift and equip people for those tasks. But he'll also equip other people for other things, for other acts of service. In different places, in different times in our lives, our way of life, our abilities, what we're physically able to do, our usefulness, that can all change. And yet all of us as Christ's disciples, as children of the King, as the redeemed of the Lord, are called to live actively for the Lord. This morning is kind of vague because as we get into the book of Colossians, there's a lot more details, there's a lot more fleshing this out. But, but let's apply this. All of us can do good, even when it's hard. 
even when we say, well, that means doing something different than how I've always done it because it's sinful or because that wasn't honoring to God. We can do good. We're called to a life of holy obedience, of, of righteousness, to treat the Lord and to treat one another with love. All of us can grow in our understanding of the Bible by, by reading to the Bible or by listening to the Bible, by looking at, at commentaries, by listening to faithful teachers and preachers, by asking godly men and women to help disciple us. If there's something that, that you're struggling with, if there's a, a, an area of inadequacy that you say, I, I don't get that, well, maybe the answer isn't, well, I better stop and, and isolate myself and don't go any further. But let's reach out, and, and God may be drawing attention to an area where he's encouraging growth. Again, going throughout this life, we, we see trouble. We may get anxious. We wonder, when will God finally put an end to evil? Well, as we're told, we need to depend on the Father for patience and endurance. Finally, be joyful and give me thanks for your inheritance and the one who's given it. Do not be afraid to thank God over and over and over and over again for what he's done for you, for what he promises to do for you. God isn't mad that you've come to him millions of times. But brothers and sisters, as summer, uh, a season of rest for many of us is nearing its end, and it is. I, I don't know how here we are in August already, and that school is weeks away, but we are. What is God stirring up in your life now? regarding your inheritance? Are there some areas where you've concentrated living worthy of the Lord, but God might be guiding you to grow in some of these other areas? Have you relaxed or even ignored bearing fruit, or growing in knowledge, or seeking out patience and endurance, or giving joyful thanks? As we journey throughout this letter in the weeks ahead, my prayer, my hope, is that the Lord would reveal more and more of himself. That's the message he had for the Colossian church, that they would grow in their knowledge of him. And in seeing him, that we would grow in our trust and gratitude for what he's willing and able to do. And so brothers, let us, brothers and sisters, let us grow in faith in this journey. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we know that our routines and our schedule and the way that our lives often revolve around school or sports or, or so many other things, that our moments of pause and of stopping and relaxing and leisure are, are not always necessarily in tune with, with what you desire. You are a God who, who calls us to rest, who created us to not only work, but also to enjoy and, and, and to, to be refreshed and renewed. And so the season of rest, like summer between school years, is, is not a bad thing. But Lord God, if, if there are ways that, that we recognize in this season and, and nearing the end of it that we are, are perhaps falling away from you, or that we're not living quite so worthily of the gospel. Lord, would you draw us back to yourself? Would you guide us? Would you remind us that, that the Christian life is, is not something static? It's not something that, that we just receive and, and say, well, we've arrived, we've got it now, nothing else matters. But Lord, this life that you've called us to live is, is active. It is dynamic. It is something that, that calls us to, to grow, to see more and more of you, to, to want more and more, to glorify you, and, and to respond in gratitude to you. And so, Lord God, we pray that you would show us the callings you have for us, that you would show us the ways that you are equipping us. We pray, O oh God, that as we think about your church, the body of believers that we are willing to see that, that you call us to work and to sharpen and to grow together. Lord God, that we don't have to go out on our own and, and try and figure all this out. 
But Lord God, you put in our lives people who can teach us and, and people who we can teach ourselves. And so, Lord God, we pray mightily that, that you would work as we go throughout your scripture in the book of Colossians. Lord God, we pray that you would ready us in the season ahead for, for the continuing journey of faith that we live. We pray, Lord, that you would draw us nearer to you each day. All this we pray in your son's precious name. Amen. At this time, our morning offering will be received. Let's respond and dedicate ourselves to the Lord with our, one of our closing songs, The First Place. Let's stand to sing. So, brothers and sisters, as we go from this place, we go with gratitude in our hearts for the one who has given himself for us and given us every blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. 
Amen. We close this morning with, Come, you faithful, raise the strain. Yeah.